Southwest Airlines to join you in expressing our sincere condolences to the family of this patron. Thank you. disclaimers as I start. The first is that I totally believe it would take us several days to unpack the goodness of Josh's life. I think we could sit around for days. We could have a campfire, we could sit around, and we could tell stories about Josh. And it was when he looked at us this way, or when he hugged us this way, or when he did this goofy, crazy thing. Days. But unfortunately, we don't have that reality here. So we're going to do our best to focus on some of those highlights of this awesome man's life in an hour to an hour and a half or so. Somewhere between 12.30 and 1, and I have no idea exactly where we're going to land, but it'll be before 1, we'll bring this part of the celebration to closure. Between now and then, we're just going to focus on the goodness of Josh and then the source of Josh's goodness. The second disclaimer that I need to give you is that I am also prone to those waves. And over the last week and a half or so, those waves have hit hard as I've had the privilege of spending a lot of time with the family. And I find myself experiencing the laughter and the joy, but then the tears. And I'm going to do my best to guide you, but I might get hit by a wave or two as well. If I do, I'll step back. Don't worry. I'll come back in. I want to start us off today. And, uh, I want to start us off the way Josh would want us to start off. So if you guys would please bow your heads, I'm going to pray. Christ, you're king. You are king. You are Messiah. You are savior. Lord, you sit on the throne. Nothing surprises you. Nothing. You give us the gift of one another. You give us the gift of life. And here in this world that is not ideal, it is not heaven, we experience brokenness. We experience pain. We experience the fullness of our mortality. And today, Lord, we come before you as a group of brothers and sisters, of dear friends, of family, and we just want to say thank you, Lord. We want to have grateful hearts to thank you for the gift that Josh was to us. And Lord, I would ask that you would give comfort and hope and peace 
to everybody in the room. I pray especially for Jessica and Luca and the Bryca family. Oh Lord, I pray for comfort. I pray for strength. I pray for goodness. I pray for hope. Lord, guide our conversation as we move from this point through the moments ahead. We want to bring you glory and we just thank you for the man, the warrior, the amazing gift of Josh Breika, who we celebrate today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's in your name we pray, amen. So what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna bring up some people um, in the moments ahead, and we're gonna get to hear from some of you, some that the family has, uh, has requested and that we prayed about and thought it would be good to share. And I'm just going to kind of navigate us through as we get to hear some highlights from some people that have journeyed really close with Josh. Okay? First off, we're going to hear from a really amazing young man, and he has stood in the gap. And I'm grateful for him, and I know the family is as well. One of Josh's very dear friends, who through the Marines he would call brother, who has stood in the gap, and that would be Staff Sergeant Curtis Grimmer. I don't know where you are. There you are. You're hard to miss. Come on up. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, Daniel introduced me as Staff Sergeant Curtis Grimmer, and technically that is how we're known in the Marines. But Josh was not one for formalities, and so I'm going to be Curtis. First, I would like to address something that I've been working with for the last week and a half with the family and with the Marines. As soon as all of this happened, we started spreading the word. And one of the things about the Marines is that there are no secrets you can keep. As soon as somebody knows something, somebody tells somebody else, and eventually the whole world knows. And that is exactly what happened here when, when Josh fell. I have had Marines on four different continents contacting me, trying to find out what happened, trying to find out how they could help, where they could be, what they could do to help the family, what they could do to help their brothers. For most of them, there's nothing they can do from where they are. A lot of them are deployed, a lot of them are working, and a lot of them have their Marines they have to look out for. So unfortunately, while we have a very large group of Marines that have been able to make it here from across the United States. There are so many others that send their best wishes and their warmest regards to the family and are grieving with us today. A week ago today, we held a private memorial on Camp Pendleton for Josh. Assembled were the Marines he worked with and his family. I spoke at that memorial as well. So some of this may sound familiar to those that were able to attend. I'd like to start from where I met Josh and what we did together to get where we were. I've been friends with him since 2014. We met at what is called Assessment and Selection in North Carolina. ANS, as I'll refer to it, is a six-week first step to becoming a critical skills operator with Marine Special Operations Command. You leave ANS only a few ways. You fail to complete a task, you quit, you are not selected to continue on, or you are selected and you are one of the very few Marines that gets to go on to the next phase and continue to try to become a Marine operator. Our ANS class started with nearly 180 Marines. They came from across the Marine Corps. After the first half of the six-week program, there were only 100 of us left. 
By the end of the six weeks, there were 60 left waiting to find out if they were selected to move on. Only about 30 from our class made it to the end and were selected to move to the next phase. That phase is called the individual training course, or at least it was at the time. I'll refer to that one as ITC. ITC for us started with about 80 Marines. For nine months, we learned basic trauma care. We went to SEER school. We learned about ground warfare, close quarters battle, basic breaching and demolitions, reconnaissance, and a host of other things that we would have to know and be adept at to be good CSOs and to be valuable on a team. For nine months, we struggled to keep up with the grueling daily demands placed on those that want to perform at the level of special operations. Eventually, in late 2015, we finally graduated, but we only graduated with 40 Marines. The reason I go into that is because that means that two ANS classes makes one ITC class. So out of 360 Marines, only 40 made it to the end and became operators. Josh was a part of an, of an elite group. He worked immeasurably hard to accomplish his goals, and I never saw him fail to achieve what he wanted. Yet through all of that, he remained a humble man. I only heard him brag a few times, and each time with a dismissive laugh. He couldn't take himself seriously when he did. When Josh wasn't working, he wanted to be at home with his wife and his son, or he wanted to be fishing or hanging with his friends. All he wanted to, to do was chill. When he was at work, though, there was a switch that was flipped, and he was hardworking, focused, and always trying to improve himself and his team. He was someone who was easy to be around and made you wish you could have met him sooner. Josh loved his family. He was always excited to get home to Jessica, and I remember him being so happy when Luca arrived. It was clear that Josh was a family man first and a Marine second. He never had any issues balancing the two like some of us do. Jessica was always there to support him, and he always put her first. When he came to work, you could see him become a different person, though. He was his usual self until it came time for us to grab our kits and our rifles and go to work. There are some guys I've met in my career that I want with me in a fight, and there are others that I want with my, with my family if I'm passed. Josh was one of the cherished few that I would want to do both. My wife and daughter love Josh. My daughter especially will see pictures of him or I'll mention him and she lights up and talks about how we were going to go fishing. I have a daughter due, my second, and Josh volunteered to take her and I fishing after my new daughter is born so that my first daughter wouldn't feel neglected or left out. We talked of going camping and doing all kinds of things together. And that was the Josh I knew outside of work. He was selfless and caring, he was kind, and he only wanted the best for everyone else. The Josh at work loved to shoot, blow things up, launch mortars, shoot machine guns, clear houses, plan missions, and jump out of airplanes. Just like the rest of us, he was a warrior by nature but he never really spoke about it with his family. And that again just proves how humble of a person he is. On our team, Josh and I were element leaders. 
That means that we were the small unit leaders in the team that were responsible for making tactical decisions based on our experience and understanding of the battlefield. Each of us have four men in our charge, and every element is very tight, and every team is very tight, and everyone has to work together in order to make sure that we accomplish our mission. Out of the, out of the two element leaders, I tend to be the more aggressive one. Josh tended to sit back, analyze the situation, and oftentimes make better decisions than myself. We were a good team in that we both knew what the other was going to do, though. If I went left, Josh would go right, and vice versa. If I ever needed Josh's help, I only needed to look, and he was there, moving his element, or getting himself into a position where he could best support my movement and what I needed. And I tried my best while we worked together to make sure that I was there for him as well. He always had my back. And I will always have his. We deployed to the Philippines. When we came back from that deployment, Josh was picked as one of the element leaders. Josh was in intelligence before he came over to us, and he didn't have as much ground warfare experience as myself. There were some that we discussed whether it was he had the experience that he needed to be an element leader. And everyone believed he could do it, but we didn't know if it was the right time. When Josh was made the element leader, he worked diligently to gain the experience that he needed and to become a better Marine for his Marines. Everything Josh did, he tried to be the best, and he knew how much people relied on him, and he refused to let them down. For example, a month ago in 29 Palms, we were tasked with a reconnaissance mission in the mountains. I asked him which element he thought should take it. I have a sniper in my element and thought that I should probably take it because of him. Josh insisted, though. He wanted to take the guys out. So Sergeant Yusan, Donnie, went with Josh's element, and they went out to the mountains for the night. It was cold, and there were heavy winds, and it was a difficult mission to complete. And yet Josh stayed up all night to make sure that his guys were taken care of, that they accomplished their mission, and that everything went as smoothly as he could make it. Josh and I, one of our favorite things was shooting and clearing houses together. Every, shoot, every time we went shooting, it would become a competition, and he was one of the best. Clearing houses, though, was one of those things that's an art form, and it's hard to master. In clearing houses, there's a term that we use called body blocking. Body blocking is the act of putting yourself in front of a threat like an open door. You square yourself in the void and fill that space with your body and plates so that if anyone wants to try to hurt your brothers in that room, they have to go through you to do it. A phrase we say a lot to each other when we do this is, my plates are your plates. To us, it's a way of showing that we care less about ourselves than we do about our brothers. Josh was a warrior. Body blocking was in his blood. And any time I saw an opening, Josh was filling it. He wanted to make sure he was there for his friends, that they were taken care of and protected. His plates were our plates. And that, I think, is an amazing description of who Josh was as a person. There's no combination of words to describe Josh. And like Daniel said, I don't have the time. There are no videos, stories, or pictures that can accurately portray the amount that he cared for his work, his family, his friends, and his God. There are so many things I don't know how to describe. Josh was a man I was proud to know, and I am a better person for having been in his presence. And I am fortunate that it was for so long. 
Something about me, I grew up in a house with seven women. Outside of the military, I've had very few role models, and I have no blood brothers. Josh is my brother, and I will miss him like a brother. I know all this is hard for his family and for our team and for all the people that loved him. But going forward, Josh will want us to keep moving, and that's something I've continued to say to the family and to my friends. He will want us to laugh and have fun, and one of the last things I saw of Josh was him laughing as he rode away. And that seems fitting. In the Raiders, we have a saying, never above you, never below you, always beside you. And for us, we say that to each other and for the ones that we've lost because it shows that just because they're gone or just because I'm not there, I am always at your side. We have stayed at Josh's side throughout all of this. We will remain at his side until the end. And when he is laid to rest, we will remain at his family's side so long as they want us there. Never above you, never below you, always beside you. Now, my name is Zach Desidel. Uh, Josh and I met in December 2010 in Virginia Beach. Uh, back then, we were Lance Corporals Desidel and Breika. Uh, we were both five months into our Marine Corps career, uh, having both completed boot camp and just basic combat training at that time. At this time, we were to begin our training as Marine Corps intelligence analysts. During our five-month stay at the Navy Marine Corps Intelligence Training Center, Josh and I developed a friendly competition for top spot in the class. We were always neck and neck with each other, both being designated as squad leaders in the class, as well as fighting for top spot for GPA. At the end of the meticulous course, all students are given the opportunity to pick their assigned duty station based off of your class ranking. There were 28 choices and 28 students Josh and I finished first and second. We both wanted to go to an infantry battalion in California. Uh, when it came, came time to pick the duty stations, there were two total California-based infantry units. Two weeks later, Josh and I checked into 1st Battalion, 4th Marines in Calif Camp Pendleton, California. We were roommates for three years. However, after a few years, our stories split up when Josh received orders to Okinawa, Japan. I was devastated when I learned my best friend would be moving to the other side of the world. Luckily, Jess had already been stealing him from me for a few months at this point, preparing me in the process. Eventually, Josh made the decision to pursue his dream of assuming a combat role in the Marine Corps. However, he didn't take the easy route. He chose to take a shot at the most elite combat role the Marine Corps has to offer, a MARSOC critical skills operator. I, on the other hand, decided to go to college. I think in our own ways, we were each jealous of the path the other had taken. Over time, Josh and I didn't talk as much as we used to, being consumed in our professional and family lives, but we always made sure to catch each other up on the big things in life. As I was writing this, I looked back at our most recent text messages and reflected on the growth and maturation of our friendship. The messages consisted of nothing but talk of Luca and the child that my wife and I are expecting in September. I can't help but think about how much I looked forward to reaching out to Josh for any fatherly advice he had and the 10 months of experience he had ahead of me. In the same way that I enjoyed conversing about our own personal marital journeys with each other. I truly looked up to Josh in these aspects and respected his advice. I can sit here and tell you about nine years worth of stories I have about Josh and define who he was. Instead, I would like to speak to the most significant aspect of who Josh was. Josh is most distinctively defined by his identity in Jesus Christ. When talking to an acquaintance of ours the other day, he told me Josh was one of the strongest Christians I have ever met in the Marine Corps. 
And I, too, stand by this statement. When I met Josh, I myself was not a Christian, and I was not a passive non-believer either. I would constantly argue with Josh and others against their beliefs as Christians. And I can't say I was always nice or tactful about it either. However, Josh unwaveringly defended his faith every time. Josh was open and unashamed in his faith in Jesus. Despite our disagreements, Josh continued to plant seeds, whether it be listening to worship music in the room or inviting me to church. I was not there for Josh's entire Marine Corps career, but I have to believe I was not a special case. The Marine Corps was, in a way, Josh's ministry as a Christian. I'm reminded of Luke 15:7. I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. It has been four years now since I have accepted Christ in my life, and I have no doubt that the Holy Spirit absolutely used Josh in laying the groundwork for that. I am proud of Josh. I am grateful to have known him. He's more than a friend. He is my brother. I love Josh with all my heart, and I miss him. I will never be able to get over Josh, losing Josh from this world. But I have peace in knowing that he is in heaven, in eternal peace and glory, walking with the Lord. Thank you. In your program, it says that there was going to be a, a sharing by Josh's other half, by the one who the Lord knit together, who Josh continues to live in, and then who Josh, Josh lives through in your son, Luca. And we had a deal, me and Jess. She could give me a look, which she just gave me. And that look is, Daniel, will you? And I would be honored to. I'm going to read your words, my sister. From Jessica, my husband, Joshua Breika, was the most selfless man I've ever met. I'm not sure what to say here today that will ever be enough to describe how remarkable he was. He loved God, and I saw that from the first time we got to spend time together. The first time Josh and I hung out was about seven years ago when he asked me to go to the Marine Corps Ball. When I saw Josh for the first time in his dress blues, I didn't want to take my eyes off him because I thought he was so handsome. Ever since that night, we could not, we could not stop talking to each other. We just clicked, and I never had such peace and calmness talking to anyone in my life. I felt like he understood me even before I would talk sometimes. Joshua had to be stationed in Okinawa, Japan, and I, I did not get to see him for a year and two months, and this is where our relationship grew to a whole different level. We got engaged, and then he decided to join the Marine Corps Special Operations Command. Soon after we got married, and we never felt more in love. Joshua treated me with the purest form of love there could possibly be. He always did the best to make sure I was happy and always put me before him. The love Josh gave me is indescribable. I always felt so blessed by God in my marriage and was always wondering, how can God have created a human so close to perfection? From the start of our journey and throughout our entire relationship, I never once heard him yell. Never once disrespect me. And he was always slow to anger. Love is the greatest gift we can ever give, and God blessed me with it in my relationship to Josh. Josh and I sometimes talked about having kids when we were dating, and I saw a really strong desire from him to be a father, which attracted, to, attracted me to him even more. After three years of marriage, we were blessed with our son, Luca Joshua. The meaning of Luca is light, and I saw how much light Luca brought to my husband's eyes every time he would come home from work, and they would be inseparable. The weekends were our favorite time because we got to spend family time together and Joshua loved it to his core. I will always talk to Luca about how his father did
did his best, whether it was at work or in his home life. Josh was always telling me to be positive and always made me happy when I was down. I struggle every day. I've struggled every day since I got the news. And I'm thinking to myself, how can I be positive about this? Because that's not the first thought that comes to someone's mind. But then I remember all the talks I had with Josh about being positive. And the positive thing about this is that my husband is with our creator. And he's not dead, but alive in Christ. I will miss him for the rest of my days on this earth, but I am so happy I can say that I will see him again, and it won't be for a few years, but for eternity. Joshua's the love of my life, and our love will continue to shine through our son, Luca. I love you to the moon and back, Josh, and I cannot wait to see you again. <laughs>